for me putting this program together. So anyway, welcome to Cody, if nobody said it. And a big thanks to AWRL and the uh, uh, club here for, for putting on the program. And uh, so we'll get kind of get started in this. I, and I'm an amateur, I'm not an expert in this, so I kind of learned some of this stuff on the fly. I'm not sure if all of it's exact. If anybody's got any ideas, we can, we can talk about that as we go through it or at the end. Anyway, here's a couple of $20 words for you. And we're glad we got Wyoming boots on because otherwise it's going to run over the top. <laughs> ephemeron and Delphiology. Well, what the heck does that mean? Well, Ephemeron is kind of like smoke. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. So it's kind of the nature of QSL cards, the paper ones too. They might be here. And then again, they might be in your basement, full of mold, and next thing you know, they're on the doorstep for the garbage man. And the other thing is deltiology. Well, what the heck is that? Well, these are words you can use at your ne next uh, coffee meeting with your ham buddies or even some of the other guys to say, well, what did you learn in Cody? Well, okay. Some guy came up with this in 1945, and it's a study of picture postcards. Well, QSL cards are pretty close to that, so... They, I think they qualify as a picture postcard. So that we're going to kind of talk about Dell theology. Well, as full disclosure on me, as per the Fox business people, I don't have any print company. I'm not affiliated with any print company. Although I did watch my buddy W0KXP run a hot linotype machine back in the early days of my high school. And that was a machine, basically a typewriter, and it put out hot lead reversal type putting into newspapers and he he worked for the well he, he didn't really work for him he was a college professor of journalism and he kind of did this on the side to help these folks they put off a German language newspaper in North Dakota which is long since gone well I'm not an AWR official but I've held uh, offices in the past I don't always agree with the Mecca but I'm a life member so there uh, I was invited to use LOTW and did it for the National Parks on the Air, but otherwise I don't use that. I kind of like the old hard cards, and uh, a couple reasons why we'll kind of get into that. Media stocks, no, I don't own them. I had AT&T, Loose, and Ameritech, U.S. West. What are those companies? Oh yeah, I think they're called CenturyLink now, and they've been all the way through. But the old judge that carved them up, maybe he should have been subdivided too. My opinion. Anyway, I was media trained. I delivered the Bismarck Tribune back when it was a PM newspaper. It's AM now. And that's the paper that had the old Dakota Territory on it. And uh, that's kind of where it came from. And Custer maybe should have stayed put. And that was kind of the headline back, back when Custer came through. So I <laughs> uh, did the sign-off news and a cameraman for a one-horse CBS affiliate in a one-station market. So we were... We were dominating the market. We had 100% of the viewers. Oh boy. And we had state-of-the-art stuff, image orthicon, black and white camera, a turret lens, click, click, four of them. Oh boy. And then I worked there and I was about 16 years old. Anyway, I got the word from Bill Kayser UV, and I see he's, he's back there, that some eight was at the Fargo Hamfest and had info on a website SilentKeyHQ.com for memorials to deceased hams. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And I did have a bunch of old QSL cards. I had 62 and found out I was obsolete. And so I started entering data to memorialize some of these uh, silent keys. And that's kind of how I got, got hooked on this and kind of kind of thought about this project. So what's the oldest human memorial? Well. These guys went hunting and they thought they wanted to remember it. Well, so maybe they did that. That's 40,000 years ago. Well, QSL card is basically the same thing. It's a memorial to a contact. We made a contact. We want to say, okay, verify it. We happened. This did it. It, it was something that occurred. And it's kind of something to remember. It's a remembrance, kind of like uh, pictures and so forth. Well, what's the oldest human memorial that's around? One of these? Or the hand? No, that's a trick question. It might be 
the Voyager because our, our buddy that's, that's gone, he said, well, that'll go maybe 40,000 years and on and on. And then maybe some other civilization will discover it. So that might be lasting, but then again, too, maybe some object will pull it into, uh, into it and destroy it or something. So that's kind of what, what that is. Okay, so anyway, the cards are paper. They're subject to degradation. The trick is to make them last. Saving it, paper conservation, digital conservation, and where. So we'll talk about it. So what's the first thing you need? Well, you need a hand license to get a call sign. Then you can get QSL cards printed up. Well, I kind of went back and I said, well, okay, besides ham, what, what were some of the first things? And I don't know if you can read all the small print in the back, but, you know, 1895 was the Marconi, two Mexico Tango, the Titanic, Mike Gulf Yankee, that was the call sign. 1920, they say the earliest station, KDKA in Pittsburgh, and that had previous call signs of 8XK and 8ZZ. But, you got to remember, that back then, there wasn't other media to spread around the news. The only media was the print, and how, how quick was that? We, we don't know. So, interestingly enough, I found out that South Dakota, pure South Dakota, had a 1912 ham who licensed, who had a ham license, ended up making a commercial station and getting that license. So that may have predis, uh, preceded KDKA. But there's a lot of stuff in history. It's, it's, it's hard to find it. When it gets old, you know, where do you go to verify stuff? I, I don't know. And, of course, the Internet, you know, everything on there is true, so you got to believe it. Well, yes, maybe. Um, Princeton University and the University of Pennsylvania had a blue book of 1909, which is essentially the, 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 the old call book from that period. And, of course, that was issued by the Commerce Commission, I think, back then. All the call signs were administered by them previous to the FCC. So I went into that University of Pennsylvania website and uh, some of the things that they talked about there, this is kind of another uh, from Wiki that shows some of the early call signs. I'll just skip over that. But again, 1919, 1920, 1916, so really did KDKA, were they really the first? I, I'm not sure if they really were. Some of the earliest call signs issued in North Dakota and South Dakota were some of these guys in Minnesota. I thought that was really interesting. He was issued the call sign of HAM, and that's from that University of Pennsylvania uh, call book. Some of the early call signs. And interestingly enough, some of you may remember or know that South Dakota, North Dakota, Colorado were nines before they were in the Zero District, and including they included some of the commercial stations, too, like uh, Ships at Sea, USS North Dakota. The first one was issued the call sign IQ in 1909. In Utah, um, some of the earliest ones there were uh, 6 AYJ, and Utah, of course, too. That was in the 6th call area, not the 7th call area back then. So, kind of interesting, I went to the... Uh, Utah Amateur Radio Club and got information and they, they talked about it. I had contacted a number of universities, probably 15 of them, and asked them what kind of history they had on early call signs, amateur call signs. Not many of them had anything at all. So I found the most interesting and the most reasonable information came from the hand clubs themselves people that maintain some kind of information, some kind of history on the early calls. So that was 1927 um, in Utah. New Mexico, uh, the first ones there, uh, 1931, W5BSP in 1934. So some of them were, the, were in the early 30s too. And I got that information again from, from some of the uh, uh, clubs in New Mexico. Colorado, same kind of deal, um, W0PDA, he was one of the earliest ones, 9 Alpha Delta Hotel, 
the president, and that was, and they incorporated it in 1917. So I kind of went around and, and tried to find some of the early, early stuff to get some kind of information and then to see what kind of QSL cards were out there, you know, for those kind of folks. Here's some of the early Wyoming Idaho calls that I that I kind of found on that on the uh, University of Pennsylvania website uh, showing their call book as well too. You know, and if anybody's got any history on it, any of these guys and knows anything, newspaper clippings and so forth, I would be really interested to find out. But nobody at the university seemed to have any information about any of this stuff. Early call signs in Montana. Carl T. Spark. That's a pretty cool name, I thought, for a ham. And that's 1909, um, 1930s, 1934. Well, here's some of the historic cards that I found. And uh, most of these are, are North Dakota. And of course, they're all nine call districts. So that's uh, kind of an interesting thing here, too, I thought. So I kind of collected them. I just digitized them at the, at the local library and made copies of them. That website that I was talking about earlier, that the uh, a Silent Key headquarters, anybody can upload histories of hams, their obituaries, their cards. So if you're interested in, in some of you know some of your Silent Key friends or people that you may may know in the past, that's a good place to go to, to look to find out what kind of information is out on them their history, maybe a, a picture of their QSL card. Uh, some call signs, some people who had uh, uh, QSL cards did a little humor with their call signs. This is one of the reasons I like paper cards. You don't find this in the electronics, you know. Here's ham radio. That's a good one. <laughs> the, the one on, on the top there, the, the, the ham uh, wrote a little cartoon on there. My gosh, you're right. Never met anybody from North Dakota before. Yeah, I guess. The guy on the bottom, well, I guess he won the mobile contest. What does it say there? First place, 30 antennas. Wow. Okay. And a picture. Oh, yeah. And the guy way on the left there, there's uh, uh, his enforcer with the, with the anvil and the hammer. He says, you better QSL. Well, how can you get that back, you know, across in an EQSL unless you actually send a, a picture EQSL? Logbook of the World doesn't allow for that. All they do is show you the, the contact time, date station, and, and date, and so forth. So I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. You can find a lot of cards online just to look at them. Yes, sir? Just to comment, the original proposal in 1998 for an electronic... QSL system that was made by N6VB, uh, which didn't pass muster before I got to the league, was to have a three-part message, and one of them was a photograph. Okay. Just it's history now. Yeah, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. I think we would miss we will miss some of those. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Days. And and you know you just thirty or forty years later. <laughs> that that's it. What you know you. You, you, you don't see the artwork, and that's that's one of the criteria that I, that I have in, in, in one of the slides, I think. But you can look for cards. I mean, people are selling cards. If you just want to look and, and Google, you can find cards. You know, people are selling them. And some of them are pretty old. They're interesting. Um, there's a couple of sources there that, that you can just kind of look at, you know, if you're interested to, to look at, at previous cards. Now, back to the old hard cards. You can probably remember some of these. The early printers, W0KXL. Some of the cards on the bottom, all they say is KXL. He was in Kansas City. Sockers, WADED. 25 cents a sample. Wow. Hey, get some samples before you want to print your card out. You can take a look at it and see what, what it looks like. Maybe you, maybe you want one of those. And most of those, by the way, if you remember, were, were set cards they they were you know they offered like five different selections you can take your choice of five different selections so it was kind of limited uh glenn print w3fsw a whole myriad down below w9eyh w4mpi mpy the qsl man and ta print some of those were the big names back in printing of the early days of qsl cards uh 
more of them. WRL, 73 magazine. The Monitor. Little Print Shop. I think I had some of my early cards done by a little print shop. Russ Print. C. Fritz. And then a lot of people had hometown print shops make up their own cards. And postcards from distributors. Uh, there were a few postcard companies that actually did make QSL cards, but not very many of them. Uh, Cliff, K6BX, he was a printer of cards too. So there's a little thing that I found online about him. Well, there's, there's some early cards from uh, Ham Gallery, K8CX. He's got a lot of cards online too that you can look at. Um, they're uh, quite interesting, you know, just none of them have a prefix. They're all seven something or nine something or pretty much. And, and they're not real colorful either. You know, they're kind of limited as what, the, what they have. You know, black and white, red. It was expensive to add color. Well, yeah. And probably nobody offered it. You know, the, you know, and then there was just the handmade QSL. You know, like the guy on the, on the right here, all he did was just write out his own little, little information. And that's from 1922. But I found that pretty interesting to see what, what was out there, you know, from the early days. And some old QSL. These are 65 years old. And again, not a whole lot of color. Some blues, some reds, you know. And, and pretty much just kind of plain, but still, they're nice, good memorials, nice stuff to remember. So we looked at that. Well, here's, here's kind of my, my comment, the paper cards. You know, you get a data and image, you get pictures. Nice to see you. Don't get to see you. Unless you got TV, radio TV, you know, ham TV. Otherwise, you have no idea what the guys look like. Postage stamps. Some people like to collect them. They're on the back, like the, the guy from doing the Saudi Arabia one, or he said the one cent stamp on the back. So there you go. Rig information. You don't get that on the, on the EQSLs most of the time. Antenna information. Humor, commercial, printing costs. And logbook of the world, of course, just uh, goes date only. This, this guy, Don Rutzlaff, He's not a ham, but his grandfather was. So if you Google him, I think he's digitized a thousand cards. And he really did the high, he's a college professor, and he, he did it, you know, in a high class way. He, he specifies on there what kind of digitization machine he used and what kind of clarity it's got and so forth. Much more than what I, what I did was I was just trying to save the cards. And, you know, if you, if you can do it, that's great. Um, but he, he did it really in a very professional way. And there's a little, little bit of humor up there too, if you remember the, the little cartoons on in QST in the early years. Some people did homemade QSL cards. And, and those are kind of neat because, you know, you, you don't send it off to a printer, you just do it in your home. And some people can do that with computers now. There's some that are kind of computerized. Totally homemade, mimeographed, you know. Look at that one. You think that's by a little kid? It's not. That was done in, I can't remember what year, but the, that was his memorial to Sputnik. So that's kind of an interesting deal. And then the pictures, of course. A lot of homemade stuff. So that, that's kind of neat. Commemorative QSL cards. Um, different centennials, so forth and so on. It's kind of nice to memorialize those kind of things. I was on the Olympic torch run in 1984, and AT&T sponsored and provided a card. Uh, North Dakota Centennials, uh, they, they did uh, special cards for those too. Okay, uh, printing versus the e-cards. A lot of times, you, some, of the, some of the outfits actually you can do a, a digital photograph kind of e-cards, and, and you're probably familiar with that. And that's kind of free in some places. And the print ones, of course, it's, it's costly. Longevity varies, and design varies, and there's degradation. I'll kind of go into that a little bit more, but that's bugs, sunlight, handling, all that sort of thing. And that's the problem. The print ones are going to disappear because of all those things. 
uh, e-cards, if you digitize them, at least they will stay around. But that's another thing, succession planning for either your paper cards or on the case of like the silent key headquarters. When I talked to that gentleman, he actually confided to me and said, well, I don't have a succession plan. Well, when I'm gone, who's going to take over the website? Who's going to administer that? Where are these cards going to end up? Digitally. Same thing with the paper cards. If, if you don't have a plan, just like your ham, ham station, who's going to take care of that? Relatives? Maybe not. You know, but you can kind of think about that. Maybe make a plan for that if you're if you're so inclined. Uh, more kind of specialized cards. And I thought it was kind of interesting, and I'll kind of go into this a little bit too, but uh, some companies actually provided QSL cards. Like Golf on that one, which, which is kind of interesting, and uh, you don't see that anymore. Even some of the ham um, manufacturers, Icon, Kenwood, provided cards for people who bought radios, or you could buy them. Here's, here's an example of some of those. Uh, that gentleman there had a flying service, so he put, it, put his uh, company information on the, on the card. Uh, that guy, he had a key made in Japan, I think, so I don't know if he got a compensation for, for putting the key on his QSL card. Uh, Leon from back in North Dakota, he got the, the folks from uh, the implement dealer to actually help pay for his cards. I mean, he's got his big, big tractor on there. Pontiac had cards out at one time. Uh, General Electric Tube Company, you can't see it on here, it's kind of small, but that was actually provided by GE. This was provided by an aircraft company. There's your Kenwood card. Pan American World Airways provided a card. Northern Pacific Railroad provided a card. And, it, and that's all got ham information on the back, just like a standard QSL card. So, you, you just don't find those kind of things anymore. Uh, other than if you're going to design them and do them yourself. Online collections. Well, <clears throat> Bob W-H-A-Y-Z, he's got a big extension, extensive digital collection online. And if you'd like to go to their uh, website and take a look at some of the stuff that he's got. Uh, that Silent Key Headquarters um, Memorial, he's got 40,000 SKs on there. And a lot of them have QSL cards online as well as obituaries. And that's kind of where, where I got started. He actually calls that the National Silent Key Archive. And you can Google it and find it that way. That's Mike N4MC. A ham Gallery, Tom K8CX, has got a bunch of cards online. And that Don Retzlaff, the, the gentleman who's, I think, grandfather, had a bunch of cards. He's got them all digitized. So... Consider digitizing your, your cards or finding someone who will, who will do that for you if, if you'd like. And all of this information, if, if you'd like, you can email me. I'll provide you the information after the, after the uh, talk. Um, I can get that to you so that you don't have to make notes. But if you want to make notes, that's fine too. Anyway, to go back to the old paper cards, <clears throat> Harvard University has, has a good website. And uh, Jan Merrill Oldham has got this postcard um, preparation and handling website talking about what the different problems are, deterioration, bugs, mold, mildew, sunlight, water in the basement, broken pipes, all that sort of thing is a problem. Uh, so the deterioration can be caused by all of those things. So think about that when you're storing your QSL cards, if you've got paper cards. Don't put them in the basement if it's high humidity. Don't put them under a water pipe. Uh, put them in a dry, safe place. Um, make sure that you, you don't have uh, something that likes to eat glue or something like that uh, in the house. The housing systems are interesting. Remember, several companies used to offer these PVC carriers that you could put your QSL cards, hang them on the wall in your shack. Well. They say don't do that because the plastic evidently you know, gives off fumes, leaches into them. Even the print is sometimes a problem and causes deterioration of the paper. So, And I'm sure a lot of the old paper too is not acid free. So 
all of that stuff is subject to deterioration and, and going away. So if you can if you can save your cards, think about all those kind of things to kind of uh, uh, protect what you have. And you can go to that website. I can provide you that information too if you'd like. Uh, she'll kind of walk you through that, tell you what's good about it. You know, saving the cards, how to how to worry about this, that, and the other that might cause problems. And there's another outfit, this uh, archivalmethods.com. That's another good good source of, of, of looking for uh, uh, saving the cards. And then my own personal thing is if, if, you're, if you've got something you want to protect, not just a QSL card, but always make sure that you try to back it with acid-free paper and then use uh, ultraviolet conservation glass over the top if you're going to frame it and put it up like a picture. That will save it for the, from the sunlight deterioration. So thanks for attending. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks to the Bighorn Mason Club and the uh, Rocky Mountain Division. That's pretty much all I've got. So if anybody's got any questions, thanks for attending. And I hope you have a nice uh, meal tonight and uh, a good conference. Glad you could all make it.